All right, guys, we are live. Hey, friends, welcome to my, back to my channel. It's Tori, and tonight I have the distinct pleasure of speaking to the one and only uh, Stephen Erickson, author of Mlazen Book of the Fallen. I'm very excited that you are able to join me this evening, and I'm so glad <laughs> that you are safe on my channel now. I wasn't sure. Um, wanted to make sure that we got the interview in tonight because I know that you're you're a very busy person. So thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate well, it. Well, well, thank you for the invitation. And I need to apologize to everyone out there. Um, I just lost track of time and um, <laughs> hence I'm late. So not Tori's fault at all. Life happens. Um, it's totally fine. Um, so let's just jump right into it. My first sure. question is a super easy one that I was curious about. Um, and for a little bit of context, and I kind of told you this in the original email that I that I sent you, um, I read the first three books of Malazan 10 years ago mm -hmm. when I was in college and it was one of my first epic fantasy uh, experiences. And it has stuck with me <laughs> for 10 years. It's been one of the most influential series for me as a writer and reader. So first of all, I want to thank you for that. Um, and I want to know why writing to start us off. Why writing and what draws you to it? Um, I originally thought I was going to be a comic book illustrator because oh. I, I started out all through. Well, I spent most of my, my school years um, not really paying attention and, and drawing in my notebooks. Um, so I, I really figured that that was kind of the direction I was going in. But um, we have to sort of go back to the Stone Age here because there was there was no electronic sort of um, aids to producing a comic back then. It was all it all had to be done by hand. So I know when I started maybe in my late teens, I was thinking of doing a comic, created a whole world, built everything up. Um, and it took me like two weeks per page. It was just mm -hmm. ridiculous. So mm -hmm. um, eventually, I guess what happened was uh, my drawings always had a sort of built-in narration to them, mm -hmm. uh, hence the comics. And uh, I guess I dropped the drawing side of things and just went to the narration. And that yeah. sort of pushed me in that direction. But yeah. I didn't know you were a writer as well. Are, are you writing fantasy? I am. Yes, I do have cool. a couple of questions for you in this that I'm I'm hoping to glean yeah. some wisdom for for my own journey as a writer as well. Yeah. Cool. Um my my first epic fantasy is hopefully coming out at the end of this year actually. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um yeah, I actually when I was back in college and I started the world that this new story takes place in, um I actually wrote my English senior capstone project with some of your um, blogs on characterization and, and world building um, for my my final project for college. <clears throat> um, so I've been saving up some of these questions for a long time. <laughs> sure. um, but I know that you've done work as an anthropologist and an archaeologist, which is an area that's always fascinated me. So how does how does your experience in both of those fields um, influence your work as a writer? Um, well, primarily, um, I worked archaeology pretty much every summer from mm. the end of my first university year um, for about 18, 19 years. And I still volunteer on projects when I can. Very cool. Um, but initially, it was, uh, I had been um, taking out kids on canoe trips before that you know, with the Y and that kind of stuff. Um, so the archaeology, at least in Manitoba, allowed me back out into the into the wilds every summer. And that was a huge sort of draw. Um, mm -hmm. And later on, of course, you, you discovered that it, it's it's a fantastic way to travel. Oh, um, yeah. Because if you're going to a dig, you know, you're going to a relatively, I guess, secure, stable environment. Mm -hmm. um, so. And it's familiar, um, you know, it doesn't matter where you're excavating, you're using the same techniques and methods and, and you generally find uh, the same people are drawn to 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 the subject matter. Um, so it, it's always a good community. Um, yeah. And so I just found that it was um, a fantastic uh, way to just get out and explore uh, and see parts of the world that I wouldn't otherwise have seen um, and, and to be with people as well. And, and 
there is a, a, a kind of immersion into the into the cultures that, that you're in when you're yeah. there for a longer period of time in one place as opposed to traveling and exploring. Um, and sometimes some of the projects were uh, remotely positioned, you know, in terms of our digs. Sure. That um, you could start seeing this this weird cultural effect that happens to a small group of people who are isolated for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where a lot of sort of the soldier humor that uh, shows up in the lives and stuff. Uh. It, it's actually um, crew crew humor on digs, basically. Nice. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of this almost the same thing. It, you're getting a lot of sort of your creature comforts are stripped away. Um, sure. You're living in a tent and quite often you're sharing a tent. Um, and and there's no you know there's no shelter when the storms come. Um, mm. So it's 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 an interesting place to be, and it's almost as if the the civil veneer strips away and mm -hmm. slowly you know drops away from people, and they become who they really are. Yeah, uh, you know that 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 can be um, that can be dangerous actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I believe it. Yeah, uh, and, you know, we we each of us respond in different ways to to the um, I guess the stresses and, and the pressures of the environment. Um, and that that was always a fascinating aspect to me for uh, working on digs. So I, I, I certainly put all that to work uh, mm -hmm. when I was writing uh, characterizations and that kind of thing. So that's yeah. a long answer to to your question. No, I, right. I I think it's awesome too because, like you said, it it also gives you a kind of layered nuance to the characters there that and that's something that i really appreciated about malazan is that there's so many layers to you know here's the character we meet and then a little bit later when some of those creature comforts get stripped away we meet another version of that character oh, yeah. so, you know and that makes total sense that that would be something that you would take into the into the story yeah and, and i mean we all do it um mm -hmm. you know I, I did once one season well it wasn't one season it was um I think after my after I graduated um, with my BA, uh, I did a, I did a full almost hmm, eight months of excavations on wow. at least what was it three or four projects, all in a row, and by the time I was towards the last project, um, it was running late and over budget in, in Northwest Saskatchewan, Northeast Saskatchewan. Um, and it was a horrendous project. Um, mm -hmm. The conditions were bad. Uh, I guess we were running into late October. And, okay. you know, things were icing over. Um, yep. So you get up in the morning and you step out of your Atco trailer and you'd have to sort of break the ice on the, on the water bucket in order to splash your face. And it was, mm -hmm. it was pretty miserable. And, and the, the archaeology side of things was pretty depressing as well. So I think by that point, um, I, I'd reached sort of the end of my rope in terms of um re actually caring about what i was doing so yeah. things got fairly reckless at that point um and my response psychologically is to go for humor mm. and uh, to find you know nothing serious and um that can drive other people right off the wall so <laughs> you know, we discover these things uh, in time um yeah. but you have to sort of you find yourself in those circumstances and it's always the most surprising thing is how how you respond as you know individually when when you look at your own behavior and your own actions um it's always humbling but it's 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 a good experience for sure yeah definitely i i don't live in uh canada but i live in minnesota which is similar somewhat, yeah close enough um and i remember when i was living on my parents hobby farm going mm. out breaking the ice in the water buckets for the animals and all that kind of stuff so definitely can relate to that oh um, yeah i guess you would know that yeah it's cold. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you can relate to that part too. Yeah. Um, and, and all the section roads turn into mud, and you know. Oh yeah, big you know, potholes. And it, it, yeah, and if we're stuck with with an archaeologist who's a bad driver, I mean, we, we were in the ditch <laughs> so many times. It was just so, yeah. yeah. So out of out of all of the places that you've gone and been, whether it's through travel or through archaeology, what are some of the ones that really stand out as being favorites? Uh, favorites. Um, well, there are certain landscapes that are my favorites, but mm. that doesn't necessarily equate with, um, you know, the most fun projects. Um, I mean, for me, my, my favorite project was a two-person survey. It was me and one other person uh, that spent the whole summer in a provincial park in, in Manitoba. Um, mm. 
actually relatively uh, how far north are you in minnesota um i'm on the southeast side oh, so southeast. south of the twin cities yeah yeah well um i don't know if you know the white shell park in manitoba have you heard mm -hmm. of that i've never well, been to canada yet interesting. okay it, yeah it's an interesting park um and we just had a 19-foot canoe, uh, mm. small outboard motor, and we surveyed that park for the whole summer. Oh, that sounds That amazing. was one of the greatest projects I think I've ever worked on. Um, other ones have been <clears throat> unmitigated disasters, and that, that could be fun in themselves. Uh, like the <laughs> one in, in Mongolia, that was certainly that. Um, but I did, I did have good fun, uh, in this, at least initially, in Central America, in Belize. Mm. Uh, that was a good project to work on. Yeah. There's so much rich, rich history down there. There was. And the weird thing was we were doing archaic uh, period excavation. So not the Mayan stuff that you mm -hmm. would expect um, much earlier. And mm -hmm. yet the artifacts I was digging up in, in my pit were virtually identical to the ones you would find in Minnesota or mm -hmm. Manitoba. Same, same artifacts. It was very, huh. very amazing. Yeah, That is really cool. Mm. I have to ask, as far as going into a little bit of, of Malazan and, and it's kind mm. of, it makes total sense with all of the exposure to these like different cultures and just the, the scope of all of the things that exist in, in the world. Um, Malazan is just, and I'm sure you've heard this <laughs> before, but Malazan is just so vast in scope for, even for a fantasy series mm. as they usually are. But, but Malazan really stands alone from everything that I've read how how do you even begin to organize something of that magnitude like where do you start because there wasn't always this massive scope series that we have mm -hmm. now how did you begin to build that where did you start well uh first of all it's co-created um yes and, and cam ian eslamon um and we gained it um <clears throat> and as i mentioned earlier i loved i loved sort of illustrating so i was drawing maps i drew a lot of maps yeah. And at some point, we decided that all those maps belonged on one globe. And um, that sort uh -huh. of built the world in and of itself. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I was doing maps at various scales, depending on um, the kind of campaigns we, we were dealing with. Um, I think I even did maps um, that pushed everything back about 10,000 years in, into the Bronze Age of the Malaysian era, yeah. um, where the, the sea levels were at different different. Uh, well, different sea levels. Um, so I had to redraw the, the continental coastlines and that kind of stuff. And then I remember with that with that setup, um, I was basically creating a campaign that sort of set the the foundational roots to to the mm -hmm. civilizations and cultures that would show up later, which we'd already gained. And so I was sort of uh, filling in gaps from behind. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> we just gained a lot of stuff. We wanted um, we we're both anthropology uh, mm. majors, so we wanted um, the cultures to be consistent with the environments they were living in, um, the way the way they are with our cultures here on this earth. Um, the environment really shapes the nature of the culture um, yeah. and shapes its history uh, to a large extent. Um, you know, if you think of the uh, the people on the steppes um, of uh, Central Asia um and you look at the history where you know they, they would come pouring out from the east all over europe um, mm -hmm. down into the mediterranean um and you would wonder what you know why are they doing this well it, it was a cyclical thing related to to um climate change mm -hmm. and so when they started running out of food the pressures built and forced them into better places and better uh richer environments mm -hmm. and uh, if those were already occupied then you had to sort of either conquer or wipe out uh you know the inhabitants and so so much of history is built on um almost invisible forces that are at work and they're at work all the time um and it always struck both cam and i that a lot of fantasy settings were kind of static mm -hmm. it was as if um the cycles of history were only bound to um the human endeavor um and that when you know, when the Dark Lord was vanquished, you return to the status quo that, you know, was at the beginning of the story. Just repeat. Um, I know there, there was no, you know, there was no evolution of, of the cultures. And, yeah. Um, so we wanted to really sort of create something that, that ran against that notion that rather than static cultures, um, 
to kind of acknowledge that all cultures are in constant flux and constant right. change. Um, and then, you know, when you throw characters into that, then those characters would be a lot like, you know, all of us um, in right. the sense of um, we feel this, this surging tide of, of change around us. And, you know, we're all sort of struggling to keep, keep our heads up, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, above the, above the water. Um, and that makes for a lot more interesting for me anyways, um, scenarios for characters, because it means they have to think on the fly and, right. um, and they have to adapt and adjust to, uh, changes that, that, uh, basically are forced upon them. Right. Um, and some, some do that well and others don't. And some institutions and structures can manage that and others can't. And that's where conflict comes, comes from. And that's where story, you know, will be found. Yeah, there's this constantly kind of re breaking down and rebuilding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, and also I was going to say for anyone who is not no. um, <laughs> right there, um, I'm very excited. I am going to hopefully finish my read of the full series um, mm-hmm. in the next year here and then move on to all of uh, Cam's novels as well. I'm very excited cool. to dig in as far as I can to the world. Cool. Um, so there's a line in the series that has stuck with me for 10 years and it's in dead house gates and i'm not Mm going to spoil who says it or what the situation for anybody that hasn't read it yet um but the line is armor can hide anything until the moment it falls away even a child especially a child and that was a incredibly the moment where that happens has Mm. been was kind of the moment where i really I think really kind of changed how I was looking at characters and the the way that trauma is portrayed and mm-hmm. and all of these different things and it really opened up for me as a writer thinking in a very different way than I had been up until that point. So with that kind of depth in those characters how do you start building them? Where does the where does the character start and how do you add those layers? Well, um uh, I may have mentioned this elsewhere, but I am writing a book on writing right now. Yes, I'm very, I can't so, wait. <laughs> yeah, well, I, one of the things I was thinking about is, is you know, quite often there's this notion that um, that I remember even in Iowa. Um, so this is master's uh, mm. writing program. So um, writers who were at least at the very least graduates. And so, you know, 21, 22, but most of them were actually, most of them in my class were in their late twenties or thirties. Um, this notion of, you know, you have to have lived in order to write about stuff. And mm-hmm. in a way I'm not entirely convinced. I think I, I'm more convinced that um, everything that, that you have experienced up to this point in your life is all you need mm-hmm. in order to create uh, a, a very authentic and genuine fictional world. Mm-hmm. It's all there. And it's just, yeah. it's, it's how you, it's how you mine it. It's how you um, explore it. Um, so, you know, I mentioned earlier, I was taking out um, kids on canoe trips, yeah. but I also worked on uh, in the inner city uh, YMCA at the same time, all through high school. And we were basically, we, we had this, this weekend program that, um, the kids who came to us were basically being taken out of um, volatile homes um, for the weekend, you know, to you know take pressure off the parents maybe, but also to keep the kids, um, I hate to say it, but safe. Yeah. And so these were a lot of um, traumatized children, and th- this is who we were dealing with. Um, and at around the same time, my father was, um, he had gone back to school, so he was at the university, uh, becoming a psychologist. Uh, it took him eight, 18 years carrying other jobs to, in order to mm-hmm. do it, but he eventually got his PhD as a psychologist. So at home, there were all these psychology textbooks just hanging around, and I was a voracious reader. We had no money, so I would read anything that was hanging around. And I remember reading a lot of books on that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. I guess all of that sort of permeates through. Um, yeah. But more than the textbooks, um, I think I drew more on my experiences uh, working with these kids yeah. um, than anything else, because um, children are, are profoundly adaptable and mm-hmm. valuable. Um, but 
but at the same time, how they how they um, translate um, and, and manifest their their um, trauma yeah. can be can be quite you know uh, come out in unexpected directions. But you know, a lot of it would have been you know a kind of hostility. And uh, you know, the character we're talking about, Felicity, is certainly one that uh, I was drawing a lot of my experiences um, yeah. with these kids that that and you know even i mean even our own my own family was, was somewhat dysfunctional so you know there there's there's all these these notions of um the things that we experience especially in our younger years um they have a rebounding effect on us and yeah. um you know you can either push it down and, and pretend it's not there or or try to talk it out or whatever but either either path um either choice uh, has consequences and I don't. I don't know if I don't know if we re ever get over our traumas, but I think we learn to live with them. Yeah. Um, and so, in the case of, of that character, um, yeah, she was she was delivered a pretty traumatic um, mm. breaking away. Um, yeah. Of everything that was familiar to her, and um, but at the same time, she was a survivor, and uh, you learn, you know, what you have to do in order to survive. Right. So. Yeah. Well, and I think that was something that really helped me in my own journey of, of you know, trauma therapy, et cetera, was the idea that, you know, like you said, it, it doesn't disappear. It's something that we learn to carry and that we, like you said, adapt to and we're able to, you know, become hopefully better versions of ourselves through whatever healing we're able to do. And mm -hmm. the I had done a video on her character on my channel a couple of months ago kind of talking about how, for me at least, her character really kind of exposes this romanticization of trauma victims and how we kind of expect them to go from trauma to healing to the TED Talk where they're up on the stage and talking about how, you know, it doesn't affect them anymore. And it's it's this kind of, we've kind of built this faulty ladder, I guess, for, mm -hmm. for a lot of trauma victims. And mm -hmm. I I really appreciated the subversion of that in in her in her arc and how there was a it's a it was very different than I think what society expects it to look like but it was done in a way that was so raw and honest and real that mm. it really left a big impact on me as as I read it and through the next you know the next books as well. It's interesting um <clears throat> It's a thing I always sort of remind myself, regardless of you know what I see um, on a daily basis, um, is that everybody's doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. And so I think to remind oneself of that um, can often create a kind of context yeah. to the behavior that, that you're witnessing. Um, and you know, for me, when I slip into a particular character's point of view, I really, really want to be there. Um, yeah. Uh, fully and so yeah there is there is that that side of things where um you're writing the character and um you're sort of in that character's skin and and you're you're recognizing that from that position they cannot see many avenues ahead right. they can't see many choices and uh, for whatever reason you know there's options that you know to anybody on the outside would say well why didn't you do that why didn't you go this way why why didn't you leave him mm -hmm. you know why didn't you run away etc et right. these things they are not options um, for a lot of people yeah. and so once you've sort of eliminated all these various potential choices um then the character has to somehow manage um the few choices they have right and then they seek to establish some kind of you know, a sense of control over that. And of course, the fewer choices you have, in a sense, the more control you have because you, you only got those choices. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, I know that in that book, um, you know, there's a lot of sort of vast sweeping uh, storylines. Yeah. But I think the one that I found the most um, rewarding was Felicity's storyline. Yeah. For me to write it out. Yeah, to, to be constrained to that extent, uh, you know, we talk about characterization. That that is a lot of it. It's it's constrained. Yeah. It's um. It's it's limiting the options uh, for these people, and then following them step by step. Yeah, and I know I know right now 
well, not just right now, but in general, there's a lot of uh, talk in the in the book community and writing community about how to write trauma and how to portray it in a realistic and respectful way. And do you think that, like, how do you, how would you say from your experience is a, the way that you choose to portray trauma or the way that you think, you know, things that people should be considerate of as they're, if they're choosing to include that in their stories? Um, <clears throat> oh, that's a tough one. There are two factors uh, to me that are at work. One is um, the narrative style you're using. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of, you know, help, you know, sort of how to write books will, will sort of suggest that you, you, you settle upon a narrative style and you stay with it um, yeah. throughout your story or throughout your novel. Um, I, would, I would argue against that. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes the content of what you're writing should actually dictate the narrative style you use. Um, so in this case, when you're dealing with trauma um, and you're dealing with, say, um, violent scenes related to trauma, mm -hmm. um, my instinct, and I've followed this all along, um, you know, for good or for ill, um, is to pull back and use a very repertorial uh, writing style. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I, I have no... no uh, compulsion or even interest in uh, sort of reveling in it or in, right. in you know, um, creating a language that, that sort of invites um, any kind of emotions that run contrary to <clears throat> what's being seen. Yeah. So that repertorial style is, is, it's a matter of fact, it's just, you state it out um, yeah, and, and you write it, um, without any embellishment right. and you lay it out there and then then you stay with the characters you, do, you don't leave them because quite often scenes like that by jumping away the author is in in, a, in effect um either consciously or subconsciously avoiding the consequences yeah. of those actions yeah um and if you see that you know if you see sort of you know a uh, an assault or, or a rape or something like that that's written and then the scene just jumps away that's mm -hmm. my alarm bells go up at that point um now you can jump away to to avoid the two graphic details if that's right. what you want to do but you got to come back to it you got to come back to that character and the aftermath and um be relentless in a sense in, in following the consequences of those actions yeah um and that's where the characters themselves can can attempt to sort of uh, piece together, you know, the wreckage of, of what's just happened uh, in their right. lives and, and find a place for it somehow. Um, yeah. And that will be a struggle for that character. And that's that's part of story. That's part of the human condition. And um, I think to gloss over it is uh, a dis an injustice, if you will, um, to people who have experienced those things. Yeah, well, and it kind of goes back to the idea of carrying it forward too. you know, so many people in, in story drop something in there for whether it's for shock value or for whatever it is. And then, you know, you follow that character later on, and it's not there. There's, there's no evidence yeah. of it later on. And that, like you said, does such a disservice to the content and, and the character um, and the severity of it. Yeah, we don't let go of things. Right. And if you think of our own lives, there are things we just don't let go of. And, yeah. um, that ha I think that has to be consistent with characters as well in, in fiction. Yeah, totally agree. Um, kind of going to the opposite side of that viewpoint with there are some characters in the series, mm -hmm. um, not to name any names, but I'm sure we can all think of one immediately that some people have a hard time with, <laughs> especially in this character's uh, introduction into the series. Mm -hmm. um, and you've written ab about this in your blog on this particular character and, and why he, he was included in the story and what he brings to the narrative. But for you as a writer, what do these quote unquote, and I, I hesitate to use this term, but the unlikable characters bring to the story and why are they important? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, it, it, I've known a lot of, a lot of likable people who've done unlikable things. So, right. you know, it's all, it's all part of things. And also cultures, 
have a, a profound shaping effect on on mm. how people uh, behave and how they act um, and how they see the world. And so uh, a lot of uh, sort of the multitude of character points of view I'm, I'm exploring is is my means of exploring or approaching worldviews from, from very different positions, different angles, um, different value systems and, yeah. and mindsets. Um, and then you throw them up in, in, in contrast to each other. Um, and lo and behold, that's where most conflict arises in, in, in human history. Right. Um, is that clash of worldviews or value systems. And so, so those things that are expressed, you know, between characters are also manifest in our largest scale between, you know, cultures and between nations and, and between generations and, and you name it between genders and, right. and these things just manifest. Yeah. Um, so it, to me, it would have been strange to, you know, to create an entire, uh, at least my half of the entire world of all internally consistent characters. Um, you know, when my sense is none of us are internally consistent, we are, we are, we are fraught with, with paradox. And, and I used to struggle against that. And a lot of my early fiction writing was to explore that, that, mm. that paradox and, and to break down my own sense of um, contradiction, internal contradictions uh, in my belief systems. And so I used my fiction to sort of tear apart my belief systems. Mm. But as I've gotten older, I've gotten much more comfortable with, with uh, maintaining and holding on to paradoxical notions and contradiction. Um, I don't have a problem with it anymore. It's just, yeah. it's, it's kind of how we are. Yeah. Um, and it, 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 it explains a lot of our behavior, um, mm -hmm. the, that contrariness that can exist within us. And, and then on a larger scale, cultures can be like that as well. Uh, they can, they can carry inherent contradictions. Um, in fact, I think most of our, operating methods um, in all of society in, involve you know, implicit and sometimes explicit uh, contradictions. Yeah. Um, so to me, uh, that character, I mean, it was a very close in point of view, very constrained yes. point of view when I introdu introduced him. Um, I bound him tightly to his character, to his culture. Mm -hmm. But I made the two characters that accompanied him far more self-aware than he was. And so that was their function. Um, mm -hmm. They were to sort of help, you know, in a sense, guide the reader into, you know, reaching decisions regarding this main character. Um, yeah. They were they were um, reflecting um, somewhat knowingly um, the the worst characteristics of, of that main character, and kind of throwing it back on them. And it took him a while to understand that, um, and to start. Uh, I guess re-engaging with the world um, in a, a somewhat more uh, humble fashion. Um, he would never admit it, but yeah, a lot of <laughs> humility was at play there. Yeah. Well, and I'm I'm a firm believer too that every single character in a story we read has something to teach us, oh, yeah. regardless of yeah. of you know what their background is or how we may. We, I had this conversation. I was interviewing um, author P. L. Stewart last night and we were talking about this kind of a topic and how oftentimes those moments that make us so uncomfortable in stories is asking us to engage and say mm -hmm. but why you know don't just stop with the i don't feel comfortable it's the why what's what am i getting out of this and why is it making me feel this way that i think we can learn mm -hmm. and grow as a reader that way yeah um but again, it's down to the the interests and motivations of the readers, and mm -hmm. this is a thing we cannot, as writers, predict. Right. Um, so if a reader is coming into a work and they just want to be sort of entertained uh, with right. action scenes and, and all that kind of stuff, um, then in a sense, yeah, they they would quite naturally recoil um, right. from those kind of things. And um, I don't know. In some ways. Uh, I sort of viewed that as it, it, it's an element. So, I mean, you know, I, I'm writing stuff that uh, does have big action scenes and set pieces and mm -hmm. um, even in comedy and, and various other things. Um, but I, I, I do my best to sort of take the reader by the hand to guide them into those yeah. heavy scenes. Um, yeah. 
and um, sort of raise raise the flags early on. I mean, you'll get later on in the series, uh, you'll get to a pretty major one like that. But it's it's again, um, if if you're if you're reading carefully enough, you'll see that it's all being set up, and and yeah. so you're being warned as as the reader that this is coming. Yeah. Um, and um, and then when it arrives again, you just you drop into that repertorial style and you just lay it out. Um, it's one of the things I've, I've sort of had to. Um, people have challenged me on that particular scene and a few others, a few others. Yeah. And one of the things I've, I've sort of had to say to this is that there is nothing that I can think of uh, in any fiction I've written or read that <clears throat> has not been, in terms of human interaction, has not been, um, has not occurred here on this earth mm -hmm. at some point in our history. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the worst thing you could possibly write has probably happened somewhere. Probably, right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, and then it's it's the question of, well, <clears throat> what's the reader's relationship between this fantasy setting, this fantasy world that they're reading, and the real world and do they want the relationship between those two and the answer to, to many of them is no they want right. to fully escape completely separate yeah, yeah completely separate <clears throat> yeah and there's plenty of fantasy fiction out there for that right uh, it's just not mine so. <laughs> right yeah and i think that was one of the things that i really appreciated about malazan from the four books that i had finished was that you know yes there's this vastness of the world but also what what really grounded me in the story was those incredibly intimate character moments and the emotional impact in this massive world of these everyday characters who were very real and authentic to you know like you said history that's already happened on what we what we know as as reality in our right. earth um and i really appreciated seeing that marriage of the massive scope of the world and then also these really poignant mm -hmm. moments of normalcy well okay you say you've written two books is that right i have written um i have a it's not over there your book is over there <laughs> um i have a ya uh urban fantasy out um mm -hmm. i i started writing when i was very young i, I was mm -hmm. a child author for many years cool. um and i am just now writing my first epic fantasy uh, trilogy, the first book coming out later this year. All right. Well, okay. Here's a question to ask you: To what yeah. extent is is your memory and experience of writing these books also uh, a dialogue between you and the world out there? Ever Our since world I, right now. Yeah. Ever since I started writing, it's a constant dialogue. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a it's a it's definitely a an exploration of, of not only self, but a way to explore what we're experiencing, yeah. what we see, what we hear about through other people's experiences and somehow attempting to make either make some kind of sense of it or mm -hmm. just put it in our own words in a fantasy setting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, because fantasy is, you can take that metaphor and make it real in fantasy. Right. It's the genre that can do that best of all. Yeah. So why wouldn't you? Is, right is my response um yeah why would you not why would you not um try to to run your experiences of this world in, in the present time uh, while you're writing it through the filter of that work mm -hmm. and that's that is the nature of the dialogue uh, yeah between reality and, and what you're creating yeah um, so basically you're using your novel as the filter between you and reality yeah and um it's a safe place to do it because it's yeah, fiction. that's one of the things I love so much about fantasy is it, like you said, it provides kind of a buffer mm -hmm. between reality that we live in and experiencing things that we see and hear about all of the time. But because it's in that fantasy setting, it gives us that kind of mm -hmm. safety net of sorts. Yeah. And, and that's that's the case for both the reader and the writer who's mm -hmm. writing that stuff. Absolutely. We need our safety nets as well. Yeah. yeah. We need our distance. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. When I was writing my uh, YA novel, it was around the same time I had started trauma therapy in 2019. And it ended up being almost part of that therapy where I was, sure. you know, working through and thinking and the characters were walking right alongside me through that. And 
I, I, it's such a personal project, but I mean, writing is such a vulnerable craft, right? We put so Isn't much it? ourselves into it and it's kind of like we're handing a little piece of ourselves to each reader that picks it up. Yeah. yeah. And that's, you know, that can be at least early on, that can be quite traumatizing in and of itself. Um, yeah. Because once it's out of your hands, once it's into the public space, it's fair game. Right. And then you simply have to, um, come to terms with that and establish some distance from the work. Um, yeah, I think, I think one of the things that, that I found useful was, um, once a book is, is sort of, it's gone through its final edit phase and copy editing and you've signed off on it, um, whether you're self publishing or, uh, with a publisher. Yeah. I stopped thinking about it. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm already thinking on the next the world. Book. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, rather than say, you know, sitting around trying to imagine, well, how's the audience going to take this? You know, what are the reviews going to be like? Um, that is, is just, it's wasted time in a sense mm -hmm. as a writer, because um, the, the product is already done and it's already out of your hands and right. all of that is out of your hands. So why, you know, why burn up all that energy, that mental energy, imagining uh, the best and the worst? Um, it, chances are it's going to land somewhere in the middle anyway. So yeah. right. <laughs> and even when it's the best, it, it may not be as, as, as great as you think it is and, and all that kind of stuff. So move on to the next project and yeah. uh, become obsessed on the, the next thing on, you know, on the desk. Um, to me, I, I, I suspect that that is what it has kept me from ever having writer's block because I'm, I'm not mulling over the work I've just done. I'm not going back and tinkering with it. It's, it's signed off on and it's done. And so yeah. all I'm thinking about now, all I'm putting my energy towards is the next thing. Right. And the next thing, you know, we, we fool ourselves into thinking the next thing is going to be the best thing. Right. And we just do that <laughs> over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. So do you feel like, you know, once you've let the, the book go out and do its thing in the world. And, and it's now kind of, you know, in the sphere of the readers and, and how they're experiencing it. Um, what, I guess my question would be, what do you feel like we gain by having this kind of removal of, of barriers where, you know, someone like me, who's, who's a reader of, of Malazan can directly talk to you, the author, and we can discuss characters and, and all of that. Do you feel like that's something that adds to your creativity and, and that like interaction with, with the readers after that? Um, I think so. Um, I mean, there's various options that, that a, a published author can take. Uh, mm -hmm. They can, they can step right back and right. Uh, not engage. Um, but for myself, I, you know, I, I mean, I've taught writing. I have a, an obsessive enthusiasm regarding uh, the fictional process. Um, yeah. I love talking about writing. Yeah. And it, to me, it was always very interesting to see um, what readers um, found their, where they focused in, in sure. particular stories. Um, and that was sort of an ongoing, ongoing thing because reader reading the series the first time, um, maybe focusing on certain things. Mm -hmm. If they reread it, uh, they're finding other things. Uh, is yeah. this getting too dark? Am I, am I on? <laughs> well, yeah, you are. Um, okay. I mean, it's dark, but you're totally fine. Whatever you would like, if you want to turn a light on. Your I just realized it. <laughs> Shed some light on the situation. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, um, I was going to say, I, I think one of the things that I'm really looking forward to now is having read the series when I was, or the beginning four books, two or three books in the series when I was about 20, 21. And like, you know, Felicin's arc hitting me as hard as it did because I was dealing with a lot of things that her story arc kind of touched on. And it was a, a point in my life where it was something I really needed at the time I read it. Um, now, 10 years later, as a wife, a mom, you know, past, I'm, I've had time outside of that college sphere and all of that kind of stuff. And I've been on a, this journey of, of healing for 10 years past that, mm. how that's going to change this reread. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to mm. see reading Dead House Gates again, which is my favorite fantasy book I've ever read. How is this mm -hmm. second time through 10 years later? you know, what is that going to feel like and, and how that's going to be a cool experience 
Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing your, you know, your your uh, booktube co uh, commentary. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I'm very, very, very interested myself. Um, yeah, how you respond to it. Yeah, because um, I'm sure, you know, as we move through different stages in life, there are going to be different moments and different characters that yeah. that speak to us in different ways because we're we have more experience coming in the next time or different experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of you you mentioned. Uh, you know, the action and the, the war side of Malazan. And mm -hmm. I wanted to touch on that briefly because I've never read a book with as like v vibrant of battle aftermaths as you write in Malazan. I was, I'm always just blown away by how um, vivid they are and, and the, the, the battle sequences, but especially the aftermath. And, you know, you talked earlier about staying with those characters mm. and, and that kind of goes back to the idea that it's not just the action in that, that massive battle with all of the things happening and the quote unquote, you know, excitement as that we get as readers out of that, but then staying for the aftermath mm -hmm. and that kind of de-glorifies de is not a word, <laughs> but it like takes away the glory mm -hmm. of it so much and and i mean you've kind of touched on that already but why is that aftermath so important for with, with um, those sequences yeah well i guess structurally um if you want your readers to care about your characters you need to witness with them um yeah. the come down um the, the 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 settling of the dust and right. Because that, you know, it's funny. I mean, um, I spent close to forty years um, fencing. Oh. Um, that was that was the activity I was in, and it was kind of. I always loved it because it was kind of an animated chess game. And mm. but when you're in the actual the bout, you're actually facing an opponent, and it could be for five points. You know, whoever reads five points, five hits first, or ten, or fifteen, whatever you're doing um there's no time for thinking there's no time for emotion um well it's a kind of thinking but it's not quite the same the thinking is focused on the target entirely mm -hmm. um and yeah there's breaks and stuff well you know in between points and that kind of thing but so there's a structure built to it but um then you finish the boat and then you walk away whether you won or lost and at that point is when all those other things start sort of kicking into gear and, and you start thinking about the moves you did, the things that worked, the things that didn't work, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, so that's kind of a, a really sort of prosaic approach to, to right. what I'm trying to describe here. But um, the aftermath is when the emotions arrive and mm -hmm. they've been held at bay because they have to be held at bay, um, getting the job done, whatever that job is, or surviving mm -hmm. it. Um, depending on the circumstances or not uh, in terms of your companions and all the rest. And so it's the aftermath in which humanity returns to the automaton that is the fighter. Mm. Um, and I think if you want readers to care about your characters, you've got to be there. Mm -hmm. You've got to be there uh, for, for the characters and for the readers. Um, yeah. Because that is what is adding... Uh, to my sense, anyways, the ne necessary emotional connection uh, between the reader uh, and the characters and the story. Mm -hmm. um, so that when you come towards the end of your story and, if, you know, various things happen to these characters, um, that emotional impact is fully felt by the reader. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I have to feel it first. So to feel to feel that it's authentic. Um, mm -hmm. But at that point, then, you know, this is kind of why we need to see uh, that that settling of, of the dust and, and the ashes and and the survivors um, and what they then have to deal with. Yeah. So with that, I mean, not necessarily with with that particular um, content in mind, but overall in the series, was there an arc um, that was maybe your favorite to write or the one that you enjoyed the most mm. or a book of the series that was your favorite to write? Um, well, the answers I've always given is, is I had three favorites. Um, okay. But in terms of the arc, well, you haven't finished the series, have you? 
I haven't. Right. Okay. So, yeah. um, in terms of characters to write, I would say Tavor was one of my favorites. Yep. Um, if I were to just sort of pick characters, curiously, a lot of them are are, are uh, female characters. Uh, I loved writing Saren Pedak. I don't know if you've gotten to her yet. I haven't, but everyone I know that's a Malazan fan is so mm. excited for me to meet her. <laughs> yeah, she she deals with, um, she has a trauma as well. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, she was she was a, a fascinating character to write with. And she, write. Show, she comes in in Bone Hunters, correct? Mm, no, she's Midnight Tides. Midnight Tides, so, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we see her again, I think, at Reaper's Gale. Gotcha. Okay. Um, but Tavor, Tavor for so many reasons, but primarily the constraint that uh, I force upon myself and never, mm -hmm. never employing her, her point of view at all. Yeah. And I like those kind of challenges as a, as a, as a writer. Um, yeah. And uh, opening of the fourth book, that, uh, book one of, of House of Chains, uh, I had great fun writing. Um, yeah. Again, because of the constraints imposed, uh, self-imposed, uh, yeah. single point of view for the entire thing. Um, but in terms of, I mean, Deadhouse Gates, uh, bearing in mind that there were, you know, at least eight years between Gardens right. of the Moon, uh, at least, I think the early versions, I can't remember. But anyways, uh, Gardens of the Moon got, got shelled for a long time. And Dead House Gates basically it got it, it arrived on a promise. Um, mm. I signed the book deal, and it was for the first book for Gardens of the Moon, um, with first first rights of refusal on the second. And but I, I decided to misinterpret that and, and, and conclude that they wanted the second, regardless. Um, and so even before Gardens of the Moon came out. I was writing uh, Dead House Gates. Okay. And I was writing it on a, a little thing called a Scion 5. It was a little word processing thing about this big, a little bit thicker thicker than your usual phone, phone yeah. that you see now. And I just flipped open and it had a monochrome screen on it, tiny, tiny keyboard, um, and um, an external uh, memory because it, it if the battery died on you, it took 30 hours for the batteries to die, two AA batteries. But if it died on you and you didn't, you hadn't saved anything, you lost everything you'd done, right? So you always have we've to- all, We've all been there. Yeah, yeah you always have to you know, plug your external uh, memory in there. But I was writing that and while I was working uh, full-time uh, at Toyota in the UK, in the head office there. So I was taking my lunch breaks and, and writing um, in the nearby food courts uh food court in a mall in red well, i don't know where i was um somewhere in surrey in england mm. but what what made it precious was it felt like i had been given permission to write this series mm. and that's what i mean by i deluded myself because we hadn't signed any long-term deal or anything like yeah. that. yeah but it gave me permission to write it and that's when I, I felt I could sort of roll up my sleeves and go. And also Gardens of the Moon very much, it's kind of a primer for the mm -hmm. rest of the series. Um, it's the one that was the most um, overt in saying, I'm going to take these fantasy tropes and, and, and dismantle them or yep. invert them or whatever, subvert them. Um, and I had great fun writing that, and, and, et cetera. But when I sat down to do Dead House Gates, it was like, no, this is now... The time to get serious this is where it really, like, really starts yeah yeah and um so that was that was a great pleasure to write um even though i was i was squeezing out my writing time um <laughs> in between you know the job um and yeah it felt it felt very um very sustained um mm -hmm. as a narrative um sometimes i think the technology helped um, because mm -hmm. it's such a compact little thing I was working on. I had to keep things compact in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, but then um, Midnight Tides pretty much wrote itself. Uh, it just it just arrived. And, and are you still there? Because you're frozen up. Yeah. yeah okay. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Okay. We have a we actually have a thunderstorm going on oh, right, okay. in Minnesota right now. So <laughs> I have my yeah. Ethernet plugged in. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Midnight Tides. Uh, 
was really quite uh, a pleasure to write because it was it was it felt very effortless mm -hmm. um and then toll the hounds and finally um the crippled god uh the mm -hmm. final book uh that one uh man there was so much riding on that on my shoulders for that one i and bet yeah i almost i almost didn't get to it you know um i had an experience in, in mongolia that that probably came closer to killing me than, than I'm willing to acknowledge. And that was between book, the writing of book nine and 10. So I almost didn't get to book 10. You know, I could have, I could have tossed, tossed it in, in, in Mongolia, but I didn't. So um, there was a bit of relief involved in, in writing that as well. So anyways, that's sort of my favorites. <clears throat> Sorry. I don't know if my, <laughs> I think we're good. <laughs> Okay. Um, so when, when you got to the end and there, there's, I know there's so many people that are very glad that you did get to write crippled mm -hmm. God. Um, I've heard so many people say it's their favorite book in the series. Um, was there kind of a, uh, relief when it was done or was it bittersweet or did you, you know? Oh man, it, it, it was everything. Um, mm -hmm. I really sort of, I didn't know if I was going to, um, I guess because I'd had that close rush with with um, with death, I guess um, I didn't know how many more books it had in me. Mm. So I thought, okay, and I, I probably felt that all the way through the ten books uh, of the Malaz and Book of the Fallen. I didn't know if I had anything more um, in me. So if I didn't, if I wasn't going to live long enough or whatever. Mm. Uh, I might as well put everything I've got into the ten books. Right. And it was a pretty sustained effort. Um, it was about uh, 11 years, I guess, or maybe closer to 12 for the 10 books. So I was writing nonstop. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember coming to the end and just realizing all of a sudden it was just kind of the, this void um, that had been the pressure um, that I'd been uh, under, I guess, almost since the first or since Deadhouse Gates at the very least. Yeah. Um, and suddenly it was gone and it felt very strange I bet. and then i thought well i better, I better take a you know a nice long break and just luxuriate <laughs> in this in this feeling of this this burden lifted yeah but i didn't i lasted about a week and then i started <laughs> on the carcanus books so um yeah i guess i was still sort of riding riding the high of, of finishing the series that i just launched into the next thing uh which may well have been a mistake well you know uh, history will i guess tell one way or the other um so yeah it was uh i, I experienced in terms of emotions yeah absolutely everything mm -hmm. everything you could think of um but then in a sense I, I tried to go for everything i could i could hope to experience in in the actual series yeah um, it had to be all there right so yeah do you, do you mind me asking what happened yeah. in mongolia Oh no! Well, it was it, it was um, a dig run by uh, a Russian crew, but it was very remote in northern Mongolia, mm. and um, it was strangely it was it was operated in a strange way. I mean, I arrived and first of all, it, it took a long time to actually get my visa uh, to visit Mongolia, mm. um, and then when I got there, um, the director. Uh, the archaeologist who's running the project uh, took my passport and took all of my cash and said, no, I'm holding on to all this. So I thought, okay, uh. <laughs> well, maybe a bit nervous. Um, and then we finally got out there and we had a, a Mongolian uh, a, a crew um, in addition to some uh, Russian students. And, but the Mongolian crew were primarily from Ulaanbaatar. So they were from mm -hmm. the capital. They were mm -hmm. quite urbanized. And I don't know to the extent to which they were um, as comfortable in that rural environment as as sure. as the local tribe, uh, local peoples around us, you know, with their herds and, and their and their their camps and stuff. But anyways, um, I think we had a we had a goat, um, a dead goat had just been purchased from nearby, and. Um, so it was hung from a tree and then the hair was burned off it and the head was cut off. And that was our first night's meal uh, when we got out to okay. the camp and it was okay. Um, it was a strange cooking method. It was um, <laughs> a big aluminum pot that had chunks of goat meat. And 
I think turnips and onions were thrown in with a bit of water, maybe a couple quarts of water. Hmm. And then all these rocks um, that had been heated up in the fire were then thrown in with it. And then the, the whole huh. pot was sealed and yeah. it sat there for three hours or something like that. So it cooks the meat. Um, I guess it keeps it very, very oily. Um, there's a tradition there of, of taking out the round rocks and you're supposed to hold them in your hands and flip mm -hmm. them back and forth, even though they're burning hot and they're covered in fat. And that was sort of, I don't know what it was, some indication of manhood or something. Anyways, you know, that kind of really <laughs> yep. so we're passing these rocks around and then the meat arrives and yeah, it was very tender, but it tasted like rocks. <laughs> That's what it tasted like. <laughs> but um, they'd left the, the severed head on the ground and I think it just sat there for a few days and then it disappeared. And the morning of the third day, um, we were given, it was meat with every meal. I mean, if you were mm -hmm. vegan or vegetarian, you didn't stand a chance out there. It was meat <laughs> yeah. with every meal. Um, and I remember having that breakfast, a bowl of stew for breakfast. And in my spoon, I just lifted the spoon up and I realized I was looking at what looked like part of a carotid artery. And then I realized I went and looked where the fire was and, and, the, and the, the head was no longer on the ground. So the head had gone into the soup and uh, I, I got very, very sick uh, uh, a couple of hours later anyways. And then I got, I got bit by a spider. It was just ridiculous things going on. So it, one it thing after like, another. Yeah. I felt like Mongolia was trying to kill me. And I, you know, <laughs> so I did. Uh. Well, I'm very glad that you survived to write the tenth book, and yeah. uh, I can't even imagine. So that's where a lot of the uh, write what you know, <laughs> bring in those experiences to your yeah, yeah. I guess um, yeah, and, and you know, archaeology is great for that. I would never have gone there, right? Uh, I would never have sort of discovered firsthand, like because I flew from Vancouver to Beijing and Beijing to Ulan Bator, mm. so I spent a bit of time in Beijing. Um, and as soon as I landed in, in Mongolia, it was extraordinary that there are big people physically, they're robust. Mm -hmm. The men mm -hmm. and the women are big, uh, very much in contrast to Beijing. Sure. And so I had to think about that. And then I realized, well, this is, this is a dairy based meat eating culture. Right. And those two factors, you know, played a huge role in, in how these people, um, are physiologically expressed anyways. Mm -hmm. And yeah, nutrition alone and, and diet can have this. So it, it suddenly struck me that when these guys, when these Mongols arrived in Europe, they must have been terrified because they would have been bigger than a lot of the, you know, the, the medieval peasants right. um, toiling the fields in, in Europe. So yeah, that would have been pretty frightening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and that just goes back to show like when you're writing the environment matters to yeah. the characters that live there and how their culture is set up and what they look like and all of those sorts of things too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know you, you've kind of said that once Malazan went out, you kind of focus on the next project and it's then in the realm of the readers. Is there, is there something that you hope people take out of Malazan or is it completely in their court? Well, those are, those are two different questions. Uh, it is completely <laughs> in their court, yes. Yeah. Um, but I do hope that um, that they find it entertaining and fulfilling in some mm. way, in some fashion. Um, that elements of it can stay with them. Um, yeah. And and the notion of catharsis, you know, if if I, I mean, it struck me early on, I think even while I was writing Dead House Gates and I realized what the ending of Dead House Gates was going to look like, and I already knew what the ending of Memories of Ice was going to look like. Mm -hmm. so I, I'd done an original, I originally had inverted the two books, but lost um, the early version of Memories of, of Ice. So I knew how the endings were going. And then I thought, well, okay, these are, these are, these are tragedies. Right. Um, so I need to start thinking about uh, and going back to sort of Aristotle's notions of tragedy um and and to see what i could what i could work with um in thinking of these as, as tragic tales um and i guess at that point or maybe around then um the idea of uh, the book of the fallen as as a major title for the series sure. sort of fell into place um but then also knowing knowing i was even going to take the notion of tragedy and subvert it 
Um, mm -hmm. Not too much of a spoiler, but you know, by the end. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the whole thing with tragedy, of course, is you have to uh, you have to draw your audience uh, in enough so that they are emotionally uh, engaged in the story. Right. <clears throat> And then when you deliver the tragedy, there is an emotional impact to the reader, um, as opposed to just sort of, uh, you know, I'm killing off this cast of characters for this book. Right. And I'll start with a new cast for the next book, um, <laughs> not mentioning any names. But the, <laughs> the idea of it really being a, a, a painful experience to, yeah. to, <clears throat> to read uh, of the death of characters right? Uh, or, or the... Um, even death and rebirth of characters, because that, even that's a very traumatic experience, at least in the mm -hmm. Malaysia world. So, you know, what follows on that? Well, Aristotle would say the whole purpose of tragedy is the, the catharsis that one experiences right. as an audience. And so I really wanted to make sure that I got as much as I could out of that notion of catharsis. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, I discovered quite by accident that when I got to the end of Dead House Gates, um, the sort of climatic uh, events of that were were um, so vast and, and so sort of all-encompassing uh, in terms of uh, Coltane's fate and, and all that kind of stuff mm. that I was kind of challenged. Well, how do I answer that? Um, mm. I felt an instinctive need to answer that. Yeah. On on the page, uh, not just sort of externally, but actually in the story. And that's where it sort of struck me that you can answer this uh, with the smallest of gestures. The smallest of gestures of, of humanity can actually answer this because that's all we can do individually, right. right? You know, the world tragedies we face <clears throat> in our lives, we tend to answer with very, very small, modest gestures right. as best we can. So I really wanted to sort of explore that notion as well. And so... Um, there's a whole scene of, of uh, the two dying dogs at, at, at the end of Dead House Gates. That is, you know, with two other characters, and I'm not going to give any more away, but that is, <laughs> that is the answer. Uh, that one gesture of, of compassion and humanity yeah. had to answer everything that had preceded it. Yeah. So, well, so when you go big on, on the bad stuff, you can actually go super micro small on the small stuff to answer it. And that was yeah. the thing that... I discovered in the, in the act of writing that book and, and filed it away because it, it struck me as useful. Yeah, well, it, it really is a beautiful way to acknowledge the impact of those small moments of mm -hmm. compassion and positivity or you know whatever word you want to insert there too. Because I think oftentimes in writing, we don't give that, those the gravity that they deserve. Or the space, or the space yeah. they deserve. Yeah, they need space around them. So you know, if you pile on too many details, then the next thing you know, you're gushing, you know, in the <laughs> of, of the melodrama and sentimentality. Right. No, they, they really, they do best when they stand alone um, yeah. with space around them because that really focuses the reader on those moments. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my last question for you is, as a newer uh, epic fantasy author, is there anything that you can share from your career as a writer to someone like me who's kind of on the beginning end of creating the series um, and, and publishing this year? And what advice would you have for um, someone like me starting out? Well, uh, uh, are, are you self-publishing or are you publishing? Yes. yes? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, for self-publishing, uh, this is going to sound really sort of crass, but make sure it actually looks like a published book. Mm. This is how, it, it's really simple. Um, yeah. But uh, I've, I, I've been reading a lot of self-published books. And if they're laid out like a proper book, mm -hmm. that goes a long ways to subconsciously at least setting up the reader with a sense of authenticity and authority right. in the author. Um, I've been struggling with one long series and I think the guy is sort of locked into the method that he started out with. Mm -hmm. And it's just so he opens the novel on the left-hand side of the page. Um, mm -hmm. He, he, he runs sentences far too long onto the page, onto the bottom of the page, you know, to the edges. 
Right. So it doesn't it doesn't have the look of right. a, a professionally of a polished. Person. Yeah. And it, it's a, it's so small, but that can yeah. throw a reader right out of of the you know of the entire um, the fictional dream that that you want them to to enter. Absolutely. Um, so it's a small details, nothing to do with content. It's just yep. how it's laid out. Um, yeah. And and if it looks like if it looks proper, I hate to say it, but the, you know there's yeah. a convention that publishing has. Yep. Um, go look at that convention and make sure it looks right. You know, in terms of your what you've done. Right. <clears throat> for your book. Um. And beyond that, um, I think you. I think what's happening now is there is a a, a community out there of um, <clears throat> uh, BookTube fans of, of the genre. Yeah. That now that you're publishing books, you've got you've got an, you got people to get a, you know. What publishers used to do is they they would ask the author, "Can you name three or four of your favorite writers, and we will we will yes. see if they will blurb your book." Right. And they will query those people, and sometimes they'll say yes, sometimes they'll say no, um, or they say yes, and you never hear from them. You know, right. so it was really up in the air in, in terms of what you could get uh, for promoting your books in, in terms of other of published authors. Now I think that that opportunity is much broader. You've got a lot of very um, eloquent, intelligent people on BookTube who are huge fans of the genre uh, oh, yeah. and want to support. Um, the growth of the genre. So every new writer is is another opportunity to do that. So by all, by all means, take full advantage of you know the contacts you have made um, with within the BookTube community. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, I um, definitely, I definitely will. It's a it's an amazing, it's a really amazing and really supportive community, which yeah. is really special. Yeah. Yeah, and that and that's really cool because that's something that really never existed before. Right. Um, for writers, uh, we we're much more sort of on our little islands um, and, and hoping for the best. Yeah, but I think there's a lot more proactive stuff that the author can do. Um, that was not really, I mean, book tours, they were always uh, lost leaders for the publishers anyways, but mm -hmm. they don't even do those anymore, generally, except for the, the really big authors. Right. Um, but in terms of advice to beginning writers, uh, you've already you've already sort of completed the the one piece of advice I would give, which is finish the work. Because mm. you must have experienced it. When you finished it, it it's, wow. I mean, it's that is the accomplishment. That is the yeah. thing that actually pushes you into the next work. And the one right. after that, it's finishing. It's crucial. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of someday novels dangling around the universe yeah. out there. there are. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it's so much easier to start a novel than it is to, to write yes. the complete novel. And you learn more in, in finishing than you ever will in just starting books. In fact, yeah. you don't learn in starting because that's the easy part, right? right. It gets hard later, as I'm sure you discovered. <laughs> yes, tying in all of those. And two, I mean, that's a question I'll follow up with that. You know, as I'm into the first book and looking ahead to the second, and I have, you know, the layout for the most part until the end of the third final book in the trilogy, do you have any advice for tying in all of those threads <laughs> that you pull through the story in that well, final book. Yeah, it, it's funny. I, I may be I may be sort of uh, an outlier here, but I don't think all tre all threads need to be tied mm. because, you know, um, one of the things with with fiction, of course, that, that makes it fictional is that notion yeah. that, that we can take a reality and, and tie up all the threads and, and right. close the chapter on our lives that our lives don't there are no there may be chapters but they never fully close on our lives right. and so the notion that you've left threads untied um it also gives you the opportunity to return to those at any point right. you know years down the road if you want to write about those things uh if you tie it all yeah. up in a nice neat bow um <laughs> yeah it may satisfy you know the readers but um i don't know i don't know if it's if it's sufficiently if it justifies um, that kind right. of thing, if you want a sense of realism, you want a sense of unanswered questions um, yeah. kind of left lying there. Um, what else? Um, I was going to say something else about tying up the threads. Oh, um, well, yeah, okay. You. It sounds like you've mapped out. You've got your your final. Uh, you know where it's all going. You've got your end yes. goal. Yeah. yeah. Leave room for wandering around. 
yes. um, in the midst and, and for spontaneity. I, I, mm. I know a lot of people who sort of, um, they almost uh, over graph uh, their mm. novel so that, you know, everything's got very, very, everything has to be in its place. And, and right. I mean, there are writers who do that very well. And if that's, yeah. that's the way you want to do it, do it that way. But I would recommend yeah. um, leave room for spontaneity. And yeah whole scenes that you didn't expect and even characters to suddenly you know push their way on onto center stage um <laughs> yep I mean, that, that's part of the fun isn't it otherwise it's yes. just it's kind of rote and just you know if you've mapped it all out to that degree you're just the writing of it then becomes a slog because you're just right. getting from point a to b to c to d and yeah. filling them all out but if if there's the chance for spontaneity and, and imagination to just take off on you um, yeah, that's that's the greatest joy of writing. Right. Yeah, I, I find like in my own experience that when those when those characters come forward and they kind of take on their own agency, I, I find that really thrilling as yeah. a writer because it sh it shows me that I'm on some kind of a right path that, yep, this this character who is a sideline character suddenly pushes to the front and says, hey, I have something that I want to offer to this story yeah. and kind of takes on their own. You kind of get as the as the author kind of pulled along a little bit. A little oh, yeah, bit yeah. It, it tells you you're in the zone. Absolutely. Right. Um, yeah. You're you're um, you're you're fully sort of. It's weird. Um, the idea of mindfulness is something yeah. I write about in, in the book on, on writing. But it's not the mindfulness that is promulgated, say, uh, by, by Buddhists in terms of meditating, um, but also being, you know, entirely ultra aware of the environment around you. Um, mm -hmm. That's kind of the, the idea of a mindfulness of, of living in the present in the moment. Yeah. So with a writer who's in their writing, who's actually in the act of writing, the mindfulness is actually inverted. Mm -hmm. You're actually now mindful of the invented imagined world you created as opposed to the world physically around you right right this is mindful but you're mindful on that internal landscape and the yeah. characters in there and once you're in there yeah stay in there because yeah. that's where characters will just they'll move around on you and they will they will surprise you <laughs> and you know they'll come at you with with a speaking voice that you never never anticipated uh, never imagined um <clears throat> I remember one character you're going to meet later. Um, his name is Nep Furrow, I think. He speaks in a complete unintelligible language, and that just said it came out of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, and he's a lot. He turned out to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I'm so excited to start uh, restart Malazan and, and get all the way through it because I'm just. I, I had such an incredibly good experience with the first couple of books that I'm just I'm so excited <laughs> to get back in and and. Cool finish it out so definitely hoping to um start that in the next month or two here so well, i, I want to say i hope you enjoy it yeah yeah I, i'm very sure i will i've had great experience with it so far um cool. i want to say thank you first of all so much for sharing your time and um coming on the channel i really appreciate that oh it's great fun it's fun to talk yeah and and i'm, I'm happy to hear that, that 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 you're writing and you're producing the works and, and they're coming out that's cool have you got a title yeah. for me for the first one yes the first uh so the trilogy is called legends of the brew high and the first book is the bloodstones the bloodstones mm -hmm. cool yep yeah <clears throat> so i'm i'm very i'm very nervous very excited um just looking forward to seeing how how it's received by the readers because you, you know there's that kind of period where yep. It's just you and you're on that little writer island and you're alone with your characters in the story and you know all the things, but nobody mm -hmm. else does. Yeah. And then getting a chance to see other people experiencing that world and those characters is such a reward for, for finishing it. Yeah. Have you made use of advanced readers at all? Yes, I have. Actually, several of them are in the chat. I have some right. very close uh, writer friends, Chago Abdallah and Andrew D. Meredith, who are incredible fantasy authors that um, cool. that are uh, advanced reading for me. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to, to see where it goes. Excellent. So, very cool. so thank you. Thank you so much yeah. for all your advice and your time. I really appreciate it. This was fun. So, all right. Well, thank you guys in the chat too, for hanging out with us tonight. And, um, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. And if you haven't read Malazan, 
I'm going to encourage you to do so. The one thing I will leave us with is one of the top questions I get from people that haven't started Malazan yet. Mm -hmm. They say, Tori, I really want to read Malazan, but it's it feels so intimidating. <laughs> so is there anything that you would say to a reader who's a little nervous about picking up a series like Malazan? Um, well, OK, maybe maybe I'll try it this way. I've tried various other ways, uh, but I'll try it this way. Um, I wrote most of Gardens of the Moon, if not with a physical grin, with a mental grin. So I had great fun um, yeah. exploring the tropes of the genre. And I guess if maybe if you approach it in that sense, that, that here's somebody who loves the genre, grew up with it, and yeah. is, now is now writing in it, and, and it's going to mess with it a little bit, but it's having a great time doing it. Maybe that will help. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that, I mean, that's very true. There were definitely moments that made me laugh out loud in the series and I could, I could definitely see that. <laughs> so thank you. All right. Well, have a right. great night, everybody. And Steve, thank you so much again for your time. We'll Anytime. see you guys. We'll see you guys later. Okay.